About a three hour drive, so buckle in. How long do you think it'll take us to get there? Like I said, probably about three hours or so. I, I don't know. How long will it be now? <laughs> 10 minutes from the last time you asked. How long will it be now? I don't know. Grants Pass, huh? Grants Pass. So that's by Wolf Creek, right? Have you heard anything about that place? There's that old inn, I think. I heard there's some kind of urban legend about the place being haunted or something. Yeah. Do you believe in ghosts? The graveyard ghouls do. There are places in the heart of the Pacific Northwest that are known for haunted activity. But there's no place quite like this. When Dougie and Mark set off to inspect a 1968 Dodge Charger, they had no idea what awaited them on the other side of the hill. The Wolf Creek Inn is the oldest continuously operated hotel in the Pacific Northwest. And it could be the Northwest's oldest haunted hotel. Built in 1883 by Henry Smith, the inn was a much needed stop for travelers on the journey from San Francisco to Portland. Before the Oregon and California railroads were completed in 1887, the inn offered a respite for the road-weary stagecoach passengers, not to mention the miners and merchants who braved the mountainous terrain. In later years, the inn was a favorite getaway for the Hollywood elite. Legends like Carol Lombard, John Wayne, and Orson Welles have darkened the doorways of Wolf Creek. And even Clark Gable made frequent trips while fishing the nearby Rogue River. The inn has also served as an inspirational refuge for literary talent. Jack London finished his novel, Valley of the Moon, while staying at Wolf Creek Inn. And his ghost has been reported to haunt the room where he wrote the novel's final words. With 140 years to gather its haunted history, the Wolf Creek Inn has converted its fair share of skeptics. But what will it do to Mark? And will his cousin Dougie ever be the same? Take a ride with Mark and his cousin and find out what this sleepy town has hidden behind its closed doors. A haunted inn tucked away in the Rogue Valley. What awaits these otherwise fearless ghouls when they encounter the Wolf Creek Inn? Find out on this episode of Graveyard Cars. Beneath the fog, behind the rust, sometimes they come back. There's only one internationally recognized Mopar master, Mark Warman, joined by his friends, family, and dream team, the Ghouls. Nobody wants to take on the stuff that we take on. Reviving the past. 100% untouched survivor. Resurrecting the icons of American muscle. We are the Shaolin priests of Mopar. Uncovering stories. It's the baddest car we have here. And restoring dreams. The most iconic muscle car on the planet. Putting cars back where they belong. <laughs> on the road. Here we go. Beyond a passion. Oh, that's wild. One man's obsession. <laughs> with Mopar Perfection. This is Graveyard Cars. Now, a car that's come back recently from the Metal Dipper that we've got to get done relatively soon is a 1970 Cuda that is actually the car that Doug and I went over to Eugene on our last road trip. Fortunately, it was only a 15 minute trip to pick up. It was originally in Violet, the FC7, 383 four-speed car. Original engine transmission were gone. Original fender tag was gone. Dash VIN was there. Not a very complete car. I mean, from the body standpoint, yes. Even though it did have uh, fiberglass, really interesting. It had fiberglass quarter panels pop riveted onto it, which 
they used to do back in the old days for drag racing, but I think this was more along the lines of trying to get away from having to do metal quarters on it. It came back from the dipper, it had an enormous amount of metal work needing to be done on it between previous repairs and stuff that never has been addressed. Okay, so when Josh finally got a chance to go over the car, inventory everything, get me out there with him and say, do you want to repair, replace, repair, or replace? We had a couple of rear frame rails that needed to be replaced. A lot of the, the well, the main floor, the step wells, the under seat pan, trunk pan, extensions, rear body panel all needed to be replaced. The front inner fenders are saveable and the front frame rails are saveable, firewalls in good shape and everything from there up until you get to the roof. Turns out that the roof has a bunch of rot on the inside inner structure and the skin itself. So now the, the approach is when you have a lot of metal to be done on one of these cars, you wanna leave the basic structure of the car as intact as you can as you do each one. You don't just wanna cut it apart because then you're starting with nothing, no known values. So in this case, if you know the rockers are good and you know the front rails are good, you're cool to go ahead and cut out the main floor. Just start with the main floor and the step wells. Once those are installed in the car, then you can move forward or backwards, depending on what direction you wanna work on next. I'm gonna cut our front floor out. And once I get that fit, that's gonna give me a solid base for where I need to fit the firewall and the floor extensions and stuff like that. So today I'm uh, working on our 1970 CUDA. I got all the frame rails prepped out, got all the rust scale knocked off. So right now I'm just kind of throwing down a little bit of paint, a little bit of corrosion protection, doing the inner rockers. They're gonna get some paint and undercoat later. So we're not going too crazy on it. So what you're watching Josh do right now is the preservation of the existing metal. So it's the original transmission cross member, it's the original frame rails in the front. These are the things that are exposed when you remove a main floor like that. The sides of the rockers where the floor marries into it. So he is preserving them by painting where he's going to be putting his spot welds and his plug welds. That's because you want paint on everything underneath your welds. Now our spot welder, the car liner, that thing is so welds so hot that it, instantly burns away the paint, gives it a good bite, and then it flows back in. The POR15, it stands for paint over rust. It's a rust inhibitor that is not designed to go outside and see sunlight. As long as it doesn't see UV rays, it'll last forever. It neutralizes any rust that came after the fact, after it was dipped, and it will preserve the insides of those rails and everywhere it's applied like a brand new piece of metal. In our case, we send cars out and we have them dipped. And when they come back from the dipper, their scale and things like that down inside the frame rails or wherever. If you're replacing a panel, you wouldn't need the POR 15. If in this case, we're not replacing the rails, but we just want to make sure they're protected. We have cavity wax, which is one thing that can go on. But right now they're exposed. They're exposed when you get to them. So he'll very methodically take a brush and that product, and he will begin to paint it on all of the rails on the inside, inside of the rockers where he's not gonna be welding, because you don't wanna do it where you are gonna be welding. And so when it's done, it's glossy. It, it looks like gloss paint, and as long as it's not exposed to the sun, you take that floor pan off of there in 50 years from now, and the inside of those rails will be just as glossy and not rusted. I've also taped all the holes in the rails so it doesn't fall out the bottom. So it, it keeps it nice and contained. The stuff can be kind of runny, but with just a little tape on there, I'll peel it after it dries and we'll be good. Application process is really easy. It goes on really smooth and man, when it dries, it looks so nice.
3 Studios proudly presents the top-rated Mopar-themed news show. This is Graveyard Cars Action News, featuring the only Springfield-based, Chrysler-affiliated comedy journalist, your host, the man with a monosyllabic verb for a name, Scoop Warman. Super Trey here on scene with uh, Brody Scott. Brody Scott, who just finished doing some jam work on our 1968 Plymouth GTX. And the paint code is? SS1 Yellow. SS1 Yellow. I just wanted to talk to you a minute about it. That's your very first paint job that you did all the jam work yourself. And it's a color that your dad has not done before. Is that right? That is right. That's right. You have more to say, you can just say it. That's fine. So you're in the booth, you're mixing up your sealer. You walk in, you start spraying your sealer out on your quarter panels. Yeah. And so you're in the booth, you spray your sealer. How long would you say you let your sealer set before you go top coat it? Probably about 20 to 30 minutes, depending on the temperature. 20 to 30 minutes, depending on the temperature. Very good, all right. Now, once the sealer has kicked off, uh, what is the very next step? Uh, go get the yellow ready. Gets the yellow ready. Not a real talker. Uh, gets the yellow ready, and then once the yellow is ready, you... Go and lay it down. Lay it down on the panels. Laying the yellow down on the panels. Uh, what is the mix ratio uh, on that sealer, and what sealer do you use? Uh, I do not know off the top of my head. Okay. Dad. What? Uh, we're uh, we're with Will Scott. William, you got just a second here. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Uh, Super Trey reporting live from the paint shop. Uh, again, uh, Brody has just finished doing his first SS1 paint job. Um, don't be afraid. Come on in. What do you need? Uh, tell everybody who you are. Everybody knows who I am. Everybody knows who he is. This ain't Cheers. The quarters are done, ready to go over to the body, man. Is that right? Yep. Now it's time to do the body of the car. This is the areas up underneath the Dutchman panel package tray. You're in and out of a lot of intricate areas. What are your What are your feelings right now? What are you feeling as far as nervousness? Uh, a little nervous, but once I get in there, then it'll just all go away yeah. as soon as I start spraying. Do you use a sealer in this application, just like you did with the quarters? Uh, I do not doesn't use a sealer, but yet we see you in the footage using a sealer. Can you explain that? Ooh, uh, you caught me there. I might have used one. Will, you have a second? Going <laughs> <sighs> to confer with, uh, with his father here, who's his trainer as well. Yeah. Will, I'm uh, reporting live here from the outside of the booth where your son has just painted his very first SS1 paint job. What are your thoughts on that? I'm happy for him. Apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Okay, question is, why would he just say he didn't seal the car, the body of the car, like he did the quarters? Why would he say that when we have clear video evidence that he did seal it? Go ahead. Must just be an oversight. I'm sorry, you just said it must be an oversight? That's it? That's your excuse? What's an oversight? It, none of this matters. Well, I beg to differ with <laughs> that. There's a matter. lot of people at home that when their car rots out, excuse me, I'm going to cough because this is one of the things, but I don't do outtakes, so. How are you feeling when you paint that yellow for the first time. Great. 
good. He felt great during the first round of the uh, yellow painting. Uh, Will, what was it like knowing that for the first time your son was able to take off and fly on his own? Go ahead. Great. Okay, so it sounds like everything went uh, great. Great in there. And uh, anything you want to add? Carly's great. Will? Great. Great. All right. Thanks, everybody, for watching. And uh, back up to you in the tower, Tiny. <laughs> hey, yeah, I'm done with you. You go. Brought to you by Trey Sound. Trey Sound. Trey Sound. The sound of a generation. The sound of a number. Graveyard Cars Action News featuring the comedy journalism of Scoop Warman was brought to you by Trey Studios and Big Tony's Philly Steak Sandwiches. Big Tony's, fill up your tank with Big T's Philly Steak. So is this a really nice car we're going to see? It's a good car. It's a clean car. It's had a repaint on it. Kind of a mild, mild older restoration. All right, so recently I did get a phone call. We get them from time to time. Most of the time they don't turn out to be worthy of following up on. But this guy called me up and said he had a 1968 Dodge Charger here in Oregon, Grants Pass, that he thought was time for him to sell. He'd had it for a long time, done quite a bit of work on it over the years and wanted to sell it. So I spent time with him on the phone, real nice guy. Talking about the car, what was it originally, which was a 318 air conditioning car. He'd made it into a Kind of an RT look-alike, but no striping on it, no badging. Put the 440 in it. The way he described it to me was a good, solid, nice car with an older paint job on it. Maybe middle of the road upholstery work done to it, but for the most part, a pretty original old car. So as I heard about it, as he talked about it with me, and I was able to ask the certain questions, I really felt like, yeah, I'm interested in buying this car. If it's what he says it is, I'm buying the car because 68 Chargers are hard to come by. Mm -hmm. Ones with straight lines? Well, just in any shape. I've paid 20 grand just for garbage in the past. I kind of like to have a 68 Charger. Would you? Without just, having just... a ton of money in one. So uh -huh. this could be end up being a good car for me to have as a driver. But until you see a car in real life, like in this particular case where you're buying something that you know you're probably not going to rush out and restore, I need to look at it in person. I need to make sure that it's all those things. I need to make sure that it's a good, decent car, all the bones are there, and then I can make the offer on it to buy it. So until I get there to see it, I have no idea. The only downside is I need to bring somebody with me, right? So Dougie is a natural one that I'm gonna bring with me. And I don't know, frankly, going into it, that I can survive another one. Grants Pass, huh? Grants Pass. So that's by Wolf Creek, right? Have you heard anything about that place? There's that old inn, I think. I heard there's some kind of urban legend about the place being haunted or something. Yeah, that was, I think, what I read, something about that, yeah. That'd be fun. Yeah, if there's time. Okay. See, with Dougie, it's like a little kid that's always asking if we're there yet, right? Then he remembered somewhere in the dark recesses of that brain of his, he remembered that along I-5 is this little town called Wolf Creek, where there's the Wolf Creek Inn that has an urban legend about it, about being haunted. It was built in the late 1800s. I've been wanting to go see it. I don't think there's a problem going to see it if we have time to go see it. I don't want to make any promises. Remember when your parents would say, we'll see? Well, we'll see. How long do you think it'll take us to get there? Like I said, probably about three hours or so. I, I don't know. I, I, I'd say you're not going anywhere. It's three hours. Let's just say three hours. Are we going to stop for lunch? Well, we just ate breakfast. Oh. What time is it? How much longer we got? What are we going for? Even though no matter how many times you tell him what you're going for, he keeps doing it over and over. How long will it be now? I don't know. It's We've been on the road for an hour. I don't know. It, how long did I say it was going to be? You repeated it three times. Three hours? Three so we hours. probably have two hours left. Two hours. Yeah, we have two hours left. How long will it be now? <laughs> 10 minutes from the last time you asked. So, what, an hour and 50 minutes? Thank you, Mark. A 68 Charger, my favorite. Yeah, I can't that's a good one. See this one. That's is, a good one. Is it in good shape? Yeah, still in good shape. 
pretty nice old car. 440 inch. Still, yeah, I don't know if he changed it out since we had started our conversation or not. Mark? Yeah, Doug. I'm getting really tired. Oh God, you see, you see this guy in the tow truck? He wants to, <laughs> he wants to wave at you. Uh -huh. Like, hey, hey, we're friends. We're both driving tow trucks. Yeah. Oh, now I got a call come in from Andy. Let's answer that. Hello? Hey. So when I say things like this are the worst trips imaginable, you think, well, he's just being dramatic because of TV. No, it isn't that at all. It's the worst parts of the Bible have come to fruition in this road trip. I've got Doug repeating himself constantly, constantly. Then when I'm ready to answer one of his questions for the 15th time. I get a phone call in from Annie. She does a lot of the work in the front office. She greets people when they come in. I had sent her down to the post office to pick up a box for me, a nice flat rate box to send some records in that I had to send in some, some uh, paperwork. So for the priority mail flat rate boxes, there isn't one that will work. There's a regular, just like cardboard box. There's a 12 by 10 by eight, or... I just need a box to put my stuff in. It goes on and on to a point where you're ready to veer into oncoming traffic and just say, yeah, with it. The only reason I don't do it is because I don't want to affect another family, okay? If it was one of the people I don't like, from my past that I could see coming at us in the opposite lane. <laughs> Hang on, Mary. <laughs> what are we Just going after? My car. What kind of car is it? 68 Charger. Still? Shut up. After three and a half hours of complete and utter torture, unspeakable tortures, right? bad stuff, we made it down to Grants Pass, actually about 20 minutes outside of Grants Pass, out in this little rural area. And all I can tell you is if the car, for any reason, isn't something I come back with, Dougie dies. And I don't mean that in a bad way. I know he's got family and friends and stuff, and if he doesn't die, then he comes back in a wheelchair. I don't know. I'll say there's a lot of anticipation when you're standing out in front of that door waiting for it to open, because I did want a natural reaction. The camera guys went in there and they got all set up, but I didn't want to see it. I wanted you to see whether I was disappointed or happy. And I'll tell you what, all the misery and all the pain began quickly to go away and fade when I saw that car, because I could just tell, and you know, car guys, you know in a heartbeat if it's just basically a good car. And that was really a nice car. For an older restoration, it looks good. And I love the Y1 yellow. I mean, I have no doubt I'd like to buy that car. Whoa. That was a Whoa. Oh, that's smooth. Man, that sounds good. It sounds better than the engines you put together. I know. Man, when that thing fired off, it sounded tough. I mean, it just jumped to life. So many of the cars we do here don't even roll, let alone drive under their own power. This car really excited me. You see them backup nice. lights pop on for a second? Looking good. Oh, that's Look gorgeous. at this. Look at the lines on that, Mark. Woo! Straight as an arrow, right? It looks good. It's pretty darn good old body and paint. Looks like an old single stage enamel. The orange peel. Looks like what Will normally does before I have somebody cut and buff it. Side lights work. Need the charger emblems on it still. This one reminded me so much of my old charger. The one Mark says my dad bought for me after I totaled it, which isn't true. Okay, my stepdad did buy it for me after I totaled it, but that's not like being spoiled. That's keeping me out of trouble. It's amazing. That is beautiful. What a nice old complete car. When you're out in the field like that and you're just looking to buy a car, it's, it depends on what your purpose is. So if I was looking at that car because it was a Hemi car or an RT440 car, I would want to validate everything. It would take a long time to do. In this case, I just want to see if it was basically a good car and worth the investment. Something I could do something with, something I could help a customer down the road if they needed to buy a car that we could restore for them, that kind of thing. So it's the kind of thing that you can just stand back and take a look at the car, take it all in. That's what I do, try to look at the whole picture. 
So you walk around the car and you look at the sides of it, you look at the sheet metal fit. This car has an older paint job that was middle of the road, not, not certainly the old Earl Scheib 99, and, but somewhere in the middle of the road, a decent paint job on it, and it's painted the correct paint color, which is S for the yellow. This would make a great driver car. Uh, uh, it started up, it ran good, it felt solid, it felt strong. I mean, when that thing fired up, it just exploded to life. So you know that motor's healthy. You've had it since the 80s? Yeah. Wow. And how long ago was the body and paint done? Through the 80s into the 90s. Okay. One thing I was always envious about Mark's Charger was how much meat he could get under the wheel wells. He always had some old worn out N50s under the rear end of that, and I always thought it looked great. Just to be clear, they weren't completely worn out when he put them on the car. They just got that way after being on there for a few days. Damn that thing put that some horsepower. During the summer, I still have to do the hot rod shows, you know? Good yeah, for you. that's what it's all about. Sweet. Yeah. Sweet. Well, that motor sounds good. I think overall, he did the car a good justice. Number one, it starts and runs and drives, which is better than most. I took it around the block. It seems to run and drive really well. So I think that that is just one of the old cars that probably, let's say he never did paint it. It would look pretty good as a survivor, even if the paint was thin, washed thin, and, and didn't look great from a paint standpoint. I think it would be a really neat looking car to come across without some freshen up stuff because it's that original other than paint and interior and under the hood. Sweet. You did a good job, Jay. Yeah. That's great. All right, so after the car warmed up, I decided to take it out for a drive. Wanted to make sure that it would go through the gears and turn and brake and all those things. It did that. It, it ran well, it drove well. Not everything worked in the car, but it's the kind of stuff that we even go through it on a freshly restored car, something will quit working. But overall, a really good car. And so him and I got off to the side and did some talking about the condition. Do you have the Charger emblems still? Have you ever bought the new Charger emblems for the roof yet? No. Okay. I'm going to wondering. I know you said you had a little box of goodies in there, so let's take a look under the hood. Still to come, Josh and Mark reveal the secrets of making Mopar metal identical to the factory original. All the provisions that it takes to be able to make a car look like it hasn't been touched. But with Mark out of town, will Josh get the help he needs? Hey, Will, you want to help me throw this floor in? How many painters are going to jump over to metal and save the day? Mark and Doug fired up the engine, but what will they find when they crack open the hood? There's been a lot of butchery that I can't undo. And when Mark and Doug get back on the road, will Doug's ghoulish obsession push Mark too far? And I said, what is your obsession with this place? I've never had the opportunity to meet a real ghost. When Great Yard Cars returns. This is our floor pan for the 1970 CUDA that we're working on. Before putting it in, there's a couple things I wanted to go over with and sort of show you guys how I do this to make it right. So the first thing you might notice is I got a bunch of markings on this floor. These are where my frame rails are. I went ahead and pre-fit this floor already. And in that pre-fitment process, I went ahead and marked out our center cross member and then my front frame rails. As you can tell, there's only a couple holes in the middle of this floor. Those are pretty much where my spot welder won't get, and I have to plug weld those. Over here, the front frame rail and this side of the cross member, I'm able to fully weld that with our spot welder so it looks 100% factory. Also, a really important thing to note with these floors is you gotta be really cautious as sometimes they don't come with some of the brackets. So I had to weld on our original speedometer cable bracket and then I also had to weld on the original seat support brackets. So this is the top side of our 70 CUDA floor pan. There's just a few things I wanted to point out while we had this flipped over. 
As you can see right here, I've got this area marked out. This is actually gonna be a manual transmission car. Now on the cars that we work on, I don't know the exact years they did all of this, but the ones we work on, 68, 72 stuff for sure. The floor pan itself has two ways it would have came. It would have came designed to have a four speed put into it, or it would have been designed to have an automatic transmission put into it. And then things like brackets for a console would be added. That was something that happened on the assembly line. What Josh is doing is taking an automatic floor, because that's all they make, and he has a factory pattern. So what I've actually done is I've cut out that area of a previous car we've done, and I was actually able to lay that factory piece over top of this floor and trace out exactly where they had it cut out. So that's gonna make it really easy for me to make this look exactly like it came from the factory. So you can't tell that we put a floor in other than it's new condition if you knew the old one was rotted out. So that's what he's talking about is all the provisions that it takes to be able to make a car look like it hasn't been touched. Now that I've got this floor all ready, I'm pretty well done with all these markings. I'm gonna go ahead and just wipe these off so I don't get any bleed through once it's all in there. And then I'll probably grab my buddy Will and we'll get going on getting this floor inside. You'll just always be able to kind of see the markings on the underside. And I don't like to leave too much evidence that we were ever there. I want to make this thing look just absolutely factory. So anything I can do to not show any evidence of being there, I'll try to take that step. Hey, Will, you want to <laughs> help me throw this floor in? What color do you think that block is? Yellow. It is. OK. It looks kind of green to me. What color yellow did you paint that engine? You remember? No, I do not. So it looked like top banana? That or canary yellow or something. I don't know. Top banana. We'll yeah, go let's with that. stick with a Mopar <laughs> color. Canary yellow I've never heard of. Oh, it's a pretty color. <laughs> is it? Where would you find it? Because uh, no car ever came On a 70 Barracuda. I've heard of Corvette yellow. 70 Barracuda was, your, was once again, FY1, lemon twist yellow. They never had canary yellow as an option. You can look at the, the original PPG spec sheets. You can look through the original literature. Nowhere <laughs> will you see canary yellow. Well, I just like the name. OK. I called it canary yellow. I'm sorry. I guess the proper name for the color on my old Barracuda was lemon twist. There, Mark. Does that make you happy? Sure, nice setup, though. It's a very, very nice setup. You got the air cleaner for it? You open the hood, look underneath there. Yeah, there's been a lot of the aftermarket type thing, like valve covers and stuff. But overall, it was all there. There was no butchery that I can't undo if I wanted to put the car back and make a tribute real RT. It wasn't a bunch of holes cut in the fender wells or in the firewall. Very, very solid, very good impression. Same thing on the interior. While it does need to be done right sometime down the road, it's very presentable right now. So when I walk around the car and I start at the front bumper and the back and I'm just kind of inventorying everything in my mind, I know that it's a good car. I know we're probably somewhere in the middle of where we had talked about for buying numbers and I knew I wanted to buy the car at that point. Yes, look at that. The Pi 10 on there. That is nice. Originally a 318 car, right, Jay? Yes, sir. Okay. Looks like something you'd do, huh, Mark? Put in a 440. I did. I had a 318 in mind, my 70 Charger. Originally, it was a 383 two barrel. The guy I got it from had put a 318 in it out of a 74 Roadrunner. And then, of course, as soon as I got it, the races were on. He had his Barracuda. I had mine. Jeff had his Chevelle. Everybody had to go fast. So I, I grabbed a 440 out of a 68 Coronet RT and put in that thing in it. It was a bad engine, wasn't it? Was it? a bad mamma jamma. Yeah. So, you know, after spending a little bit of time with Jay there and getting to know some of the backstory on it, we really were wrapped up. We didn't have time to get over and see the Boltaco guy that I was telling Doug about earlier that restored my bike. We're gonna make another trip down there someday. But we did want to try to get enough time to go by Dougie's favorite place. So he wants to meet a real ghost. That's what he said. At one time, and I, and I just, all the cameras had kicked off and I said, what is your obsession with this place? And he goes, because I've never had the opportunity to meet a real ghost. Got that okay, Nancy? I've got her. Okay. Just trying to offer assistance. Drop that down a little bit there. 
almost need a new floor pan by the time you get this thing. Try not to cut our fingers. Yeah. Safety first. Josh gets kind of crazy when he does this stuff, but like usual, here we are. Will, come help, come help. Well, I remember last so, time you tried cutting my finger off. But... Try having man fingers. You have baby fingers. No. A paper cut would take your pinky off. <laughs> All right, where's my screw gun? Let's get this drilled in. I want All this right. welded up today. I'll get her welded today, but I gotta get this side in first. Okay, well, let's get it going. All right. You see what I work with? How many painters gotta jump over to metal and save the day? You know, I give my whole team crap all day long. But I do it with a smile so they can't get mad. I learned that from Mark. But this is what Mark did to me, so I do the same to them. And as far as our metal shop goes, it's the best team we've ever had here. And Josh is a huge part of that. He's got a heart of gold, he goes the extra mile, and he truly wants every car perfect, and he goes about it in a great way. All right, we ready to screw? Well, I mean, yeah, I'm ready to screw the floor down. Let's get her screwed. All right. We're just going to shove it in there. Money. Just like that. Yeah. Go Thank you. Get it welded up and we'll be good to go. Thank you for your help. Well, you're welcome, buddy. We got the car loaded up and we're able to head back north on I-5, destination the Wolf Creek Inn. Stay tuned, there's more metal and more secrets to reveal. Even though there's screws, I've actually seen those things break before. And just when you thought it was safe to go back on the highway, Mark and Dougie finally arrive at the oldest and possibly the most haunted hotel in the Pacific Northwest. Finally, finally I get to go see a real ghost. When Graveyard Cars return. doing here is I'm getting uh, now that I've got the floor all screwed into place where I want it I'm gonna go ahead and do a couple spot welds to anchor it in place if I just ended up spot welding one whole side full I could actually move the floor on the other side so even though there's screws I've actually seen those things break before so I'm gonna do three spot welds over here and then after I'm done with this side I'm gonna go do three spot welds on the other side and the floor will be anchored in place perfectly All right, now that I got a spot weld on the frame rail and then one on each of the, the seat supports, I'm gonna go to the other side, do the exact same thing, and I'll come back over here and do a couple MIG welds also to anchor it in place. All right, so what I'm doing now, I'm gonna do a couple plug welds on the sides also to get those anchored. The reason I put those spot welds originally where I did is to make sure that floor got sucked down all the way. So when I plug weld the sides, it's where it needs to be. If I would have plug welded that first and then tried spot welding it, I could have stretched the floor or something. Look, I know on a lot of this detail stuff on the floors, it gets boring if you're not doing something like that. It's like learning how to write a book from Stephen King, but unless you're writing a book or writing a movie, you don't care how it's done, you just want the finished product. But a lot of people are working on these. A lot of them are writing the book, so to speak. 
pay attention to what we're doing. Pay attention to what we're sharing with you. You won't see it anywhere else. It's very detailed. It's very important. If you want the very, very best job you can do, you can do it at home. It's just going to take you longer and you're going to have to maybe rent some equipment from time to time. But you could do the same thing based completely on what we're showing you of how it's done here. So while it's boring for you, for some of you, it's really important to somebody else. Also, if you notice, I got little tiny yellow marks. Those are all where the factory spot welds were. So I like to mark those so when it comes to welding this floor in, I can actually offset my new welds. I don't like to weld over top of those just because the metal can be slightly thin. So this gives me the full thickness of metal and I know the structural integrity is gonna be there. All right, I gotta do a little hammering as I do the sides, just because now that the floor's in its final place, I gotta make sure these sides lay nice and flush on the rockers. But I've got this side anchored in place, now to do the other side, and then I can fully weld this thing in. Finally, we got to the Wolf Creek Inn. I love this place, so much history and really nicely restored. Finally, finally, I get to go see a real ghost. All right, so about 45 minutes this side of picking up the charger, we got to the Wolf Creek Inn. And this place is really cool. I mean, there's so much history involved in this place that I couldn't even begin to do it justice. As far as I'm concerned, it was a blast. We got some great pictures with Doug. Doug was super happy. I asked him if he actually met a ghost. He said that he wasn't sure. He thought he, you know, not a lawyer. I don't know if he did, but there, there are sightings of ghosts down there. But for our trip to the Wolf Creek Inn, I call it Wolf Creek, W-U-F-F, -F, Wolf Creek Inn, got some great pictures of the team. We had a really good lunch, fantastic lunch. Actually, it's probably one of the best little diners that we've hit, and we got quite a few of them up here, and they did a, a remarkable job down there. Got some pictures of the charger sitting out front of it. So for us, it was a really nice thing to get away and do and have some fun as a team. It was the fact that I was able to buy a car and make it worth the trip down there. Like I say, the camera crews, we were all kind of like family. So when we sit down around a table, it's just a bunch of guys, that gals that know each other, and. Like I say, they're like family. So after lunch, we got a bunch of pictures around the place. It's a small town, little one-stop light town. Didn't take long to look around the town. I think they had a gas station and an old general store. After that, we got back in the rollback and headed to Springfield, made it back without any incidents. So overall, that was just a fantastic day and a fantastic trip.